Okay, I hope I'm audible to all my students who are attending this particular lecture for the MA Economics uh, CUET entrance. Uh, if students can recall that in my previous lecture, we were solving a couple of problems from the MA Economics CUET 2023 paper. Okay, in this particular lecture, we are going to continue further with uh, solving the MCQs which have come up in the MA Economics 2023 paper for CUET. So I hope all students are geared up to uh, start this lecture. So let's quickly start this lecture. Okay, so I hope all students can now see the question paper. This is the MA Economics CUET 2023 paper. And students can recall that in my previous lecture, we had discussed problems from question number 26 till question number 30. We had discussed these five MCQs in the previous lecture. Okay. In this particular lecture, let's start our discussion with question number 31. So let's quickly look at question number 31. Suppose that for a random sample of size 10, the value of the covariance between two variables x and y is 100. The standard deviations of x and y respectively are 5 and 20 respectively. The question asks us what is the value of the regression coefficient in the regression of y on x? Okay, so we have done regression in our lectures on introductory econometrics. Let me quickly come to the whiteboard and let me explain this problem to all students. So let's look at, so I, first of all, I'm just writing the main heading for completeness. This is MA Economics, CUET, 2023 paper, which we are taking up for discussion. And in this lecture, we look at problem number 31. Okay, so first of all, what is the regression of Y on X? What is the equation? The regression of y on x, the sample regression function is given as y is equal to b1 plus b2x. This is my sample regression function. Sample regression function. And recall that from the OLS procedure, Recall from the OLS procedure, ordinary least square procedure, which we do in the econometrics course. What is B2? The formula for B2 is covariance of XY over covariance of XY over variance of X. Okay, this is the formula for B2, which we get from the OLS procedure. Now, what is given to us in the question? We are given in the question that the covariance between X and Y is 100. We are given that standard deviation of X is 5 and standard deviation of Y is 20. So when standard deviation of X is 5, can I find the variance? The variance is 5 square, which is 25. I need to find B2. B2 is what? It is nothing but the regression coefficient in the regression of y on x. So I can write b2, which is the regression coefficient in the regression of y on x, in the regression of y on x is equal to covariance of xy, which is 100 divided by variance of x, which is 25. So the value of B2 is 100 by 25, which is 4. This is the answer for this particular question. Where will students find all the theory for this? You can check out my Econ 206 course on introductory econometrics. In this course, we have done linear regression in depth. Okay. We have done the ordinary least square procedure, which is to minimize summation EI square, where E denotes the residual sum of squares. Okay, uh, EI square denotes residual sum of squares. So 
you will find this in my introductory econometrics course so you can go through the lectures in that okay this is the formula which you will find in the ols procedure so just apply this formula you get the value of v2 as 4 which is nothing but your regression coefficient in the regression of y on x so if i come back to the question paper you can mark the correct answer is 4 let's look at problem number 32 the economy of Indus grows at 6% per annum. The investment ratio is 31.2%. What is the capital to output ratio of this economy given the assumptions of the Harrod Domer model? Now, Harrod Domer model is something which we have done in our intermediate macroeconomics part two course. Okay. And if I just quickly come to the whiteboard, so erasing all this off let's look at problem number 32 so recall from the harrod domer model recall from the harrod domer model the growth equation is given by the growth equation is given by G is equal to S by C, where G denotes the growth rate, S denotes the savings rate, and C denotes the capital to output ratio. C denotes the capital to output ratio. Now, what all is given to us in the question? We are given that the growth rate is 6%. We are given that the investment ratio, the investment ratio, because remember in equilibrium investment and savings rates are equal. So I can say in equilibrium, the investment rate is exactly equal to the savings rate which is exactly equal to given in the question as 31.2%. And I need to find what? I need to find the value of C, which is my capital to output ratio. So I can write here G is equal to S by C. G is what? 6. S, I need, S is 31.2% and I need to find C. So I can say C is 31.2 divided by 6. How much is 31.2 divided by 6? Check it out using your calculator. It's 5.2. That means the capital to output ratio, if you check that, it comes out as 5.2. So this is my answer for this particular question. Again, where will students find all this? You will find all this in my Intermediate Macroeconomics Part 2 course. So for this, students can go to Econ 205, Intermediate Macro 2 course. You will find my lectures on the Harrod-Domer model. And in the Harrod-Domer model, we have shown that the growth rate is given by the ratio of savings to capital to output ratio. Plug in all the values given to us in the question. Solve for C. This is my answer. If I come back to the lecture, uh, come back to the past paper, answer is 5.2. Question number 33, this is very simple. Which body decides the share of states in the tax revenues of the center in India? Okay, so majorly to do with the tax, it's nothing but the finance commission. So we all know that in India, finance commission is that constitutional body which is going to determine the share of taxes uh, by the states, the share of states in the tax revenues. Okay, so I can write here only, I'm not using the whiteboard for this, I can write in India, Finance Commission. In India, the Finance Commission is responsible for determining for determining the share of states
in the tax revenues of the center. In the tax revenues of the center. The Finance Commission is that constitutional body which takes care of uh, the share of states in the tax revenues of the center. Whatever tax revenues collected by the center, how the tax revenue is distributed among the states in India is taken care of by the Finance Commission. So let's move forward. Question number 34. There are two statements given to us and we are asked which statement is true, which is false. Or if both are true or both are false. When the demand curve shifts, if the supply curve is steeper, then the price change is larger and the change in amount bought and sold is smaller compared to the flatter supply curve. So again, I think we need to draw this. Let's come to the whiteboard. So erasing all this off, let's look at question number 34. So I'm writing the statement again. Statement one says that when the demand curve shifts, if the supply curve is steeper, then the price change is larger and the change in the amount bought and sold is smaller compared to the flatter supply. compared to the flatter supply curve. Okay, so let's show this through diagrams. Let's look at two diagram A. This is diagram A and then I'm going to draw diagram B here. So it's a normal demand supply diagram. We have quality, we have price in both the diagrams. Quality and price in both the diagrams. Now, in diagram A, so uh, let the supply curve be steeper. And in diagram B, let the initial supply curve be flatter. And in both the diagrams, I superimpose the demand curve. So this is my downward sloping demand curve in both the diagrams. These are my initial price and quality combinations. Initial price and quantity combinations. Now, when the demand curve shifts, suppose I assume in this question that suppose the demand curve demand increases. So suppose the demand curve shifts to the right. So from B0, it becomes B1. And the demand has gone by equal amount in both the diagrams. What happens? See, the increase in quantity is smaller. But increase in price is much, too much. In diagram B, increase in price is smaller. But increase in quantity is too much. So is it agreeing with the statement? The price change is larger. In steeper case, here this is the steeper case. This is my steeper supply curve. And diagram B depicts the flatter supply curve. When the demand curve shifts, if the supply curve is steeper, the price change is larger. You can see that. And change in amount bought and sold is smaller. See, tiny increase from Q0 to Q1 as compared to diagram B, where now the price change is smaller, but demand changes, quality change is larger. That means, therefore, from both the diagrams we observe, from both the diagrams, we observe that statement one is correct. From both the diagrams, we observe that statement one is correct. Okay, let's look at statement two. So I'm erasing this off. Question number 34, statement two.
I can write when the supply curve shifts, when the supply curve shifts, if the demand curve is steeper, then the price change is larger. And change in the amount bought and sold is smaller as compared to flatter supply. As compared to the flatter supply. As compared to the flatter demand. Let me correct myself. When the supply curve shifts, I'm repeating the question, if the demand curve is steeper, then the price change is larger and change the amount bought and sold is smaller compared to the flatter demand. Let me show this whether the statement is true or false. Let's draw two diagrams. Diagram A, diagram B. In diagram A, we assume that the demand curve is steeper. And in diagram B, we are going to assume that the demand curve is flatter. So on the horizontal axis, we have quantity. On the vertical axis, we have price in both the cases. Quantity and price. So let's draw a steeper demand curve, D0. And here, let's draw a flatter demand. Both the diagrams have a normal upward sloping supply curve. These are my initial price and quantity combinations in both the diagrams. Okay, initial equilibrium E0 in both the diagrams. Now, when the supply curve shifts, let us assume that the supply increases. Let us assume that the supply goes up. So we are just assuming that, okay. So suppose the supply curve increases from S0 to S1 in both the diagrams. And this increase in supply is equal in both the diagrams. What do you observe, guys? In diagram A, price falls by too much. But quantity increases by a very tiny amount. In diagram B, price falls by a very tiny amount. But Quantity, equilibrium quantity increases by a very tiny amount. In both the diagrams, we move to the new equilibrium E1. So now let's read. If the demand curve is steeper, which is diagram A, then the price change is large. You can see large drop in price and change in amount bought and sold is small from Q0 to Q1 compared to the flatter demand. So I can say, therefore, from the above diagram, statement 2 is also true. From the above diagrams, statement 2 is also true. That means what do we learn? Therefore, the answer of this question is both the statements 1 and 2 are true. Both the statements 1 and 2 are true. Okay. Where will you find this? These concepts have been covered in my Econ 101 course, Introductory Microeconomics. The concepts of demand and supply are all covered in my Econ 101 course. So if I come back to the, uh, to the question paper, we can mark the correct answer. The correct answer is both the statements 1 and 2 are true. Option A is the correct answer.
And let's look at the last question for this particular lecture after which we stop question number 35. Consider the following for natural monopoly. Now, natural monopoly, again, we have done this in our uh, microeconomics course in both our introductory as well as intermediate macroeconom microeconomics course. When the firm's average cost of producing a good continuously declines, a natural monopoly arises. Correct. We know from the natural monopoly diagram that a natural monopolist always has a downward sloping average cost curve. So now, guys, look at the options. We have known that A is correct. If A is correct, either it has to be A or it has to be C. It cannot be B and D because B and D don't contain option A. But option A is correct. A natural monopoly always has a downward sloping average cost curve. This is the correct statement. Remember, in the MCQs, we also need to do smart work. You don't need to look at all the parts. We also need to save on time when cracking these MCQs. So we have known that we know that A is the correct option. So I don't need to look at option B and D because B and D don't contain A. That means we need to check if B or C is correct. Now look at C. A market is a natural monopoly when a good is produced most economically by a single firm. And natural monopolies follow marginal cost pricing all times. B is wrong. Natural monopolies don't always follow marginal cost pricing. Natural monopolies follow marginal cost pricing only when they are regulated by the government. Only when the government regulates a natural monopoly, they follow marginal cost pricing. Not always. And option C is correct. Why? Because when you are a natural monopoly, you, you get the advantage of economies of scale. Now, all students remember economies of scale is covered in depth in my lectures in intermediate macro, microeconomics. Okay. You will check this out in my intermediate microeconomics part two course. Okay. So when we talk about a natural monopoly, a natural monopoly has a downward sloping average cost curve. Okay. Uh, for a fixed cost, as the firm produces bulk output, its average cost continues to fall. So we can say that in case of a um, natural monopoly, the output is produced or the good is produced most economically because of economies of scale. So the correct answer is A and C. Option C is the correct answer. A and C both are correct. So I am also coming to the whiteboard just to draw the diagram for natural monopoly for all students. So for problem number 35, okay, look at the diagram I'm drawing for a natural monopoly. This is quantity, this is price, okay. Uh, we have the downward sloping average revenue curve, also called the demand curve facing the monopolist. The monopolist has a downward sloping marginal revenue curve, which can even enter the negative axis. Okay. And uh, we have the downward sloping average cost curve in case of a natural monopoly. This is the average cost. Okay. So demand curve is downward sloping, also called the average revenue curve. Marginal revenue lies below the AR curve. Average cost curve continues to fall. So I can write the explanation clearly. A natural monopolist has a natural monopolist has a downward. So first of all, let me erase this part. Let me write clearly, a natural monopolist has a downward sloping average cost. Let me also draw the diagram more clearly. A natural monopolist has a downward sloping average cost curve because it takes advantage of economies of scale. So initially, the fixed costs are very high. But eventually, because of bulk production of output, the average fixed costs continue to fall. As a result, the average cost 
which is the sum of average fixed cost and average variable cost continues to hold. Okay, so a monopolist, a natural monopolist always has a downward sloping average cost curve. Example of natural monopoly in India, Indian Railways. Indian Railways is the best example of a natural monopolist in India. Okay, so I can write that because of economies of scale, because of economies of scale, a good is produced most economically, a good is produced most economically by the natural monopoly. Your average cost curve is always falling. That means you are producing the good most economically. And this happens because of economies of scale. Okay. Economies of scale simply means that over bulk production, average cost continues to fall. Okay. So I stop in this particular lecture. Okay. Again, where will you find these concepts? You will find them in my Econ 204. in my intermediate micro part two course when I've done mono where I've done monopoly in depth. So you check you can check out my econ 204 course. Why I'm sharing these course codes with every problem? The reason being that students should be able to map the theory they have done in my courses with the MCQs which have come up in the MA Eco CUET MCQs. After watching these lectures Students should be completely convinced and satisfied that whatever content they have gone through in terms of the courses is what comes up in the MA Eco CUAT entrance. That means if you do my courses properly, be it introductory, be it intermediate, or be it advanced econ courses, you should be able to handle mostly all MCQs which come up in the MA Eco CUAT entrance. So I stop in this lecture, okay? In the next lecture, we continue with our discussion from question 36. In the next lecture, we continue with our discussion from question 36 onwards. Okay, so I stop. I hope all students have enjoyed this lecture. Any doubts you have in this lecture, you can unmute your mics and ask, or you can get in touch with me through call. Or you can drop me a mail with your doubts at divine school of economics at the rate gmail.com. This is where I stop in this lecture.